Welcome to Revelations with Aaron Pitsy. On this show, we will be exploring the issues faced by men and boys everywhere, as well as the women and girls who love them. Your host, Aaron Pitsy, was born in 1939 in China while her father was stationed there as a member of the British Foreign Office. In 1971, Aaron opened the first ever domestic violence refuge for battered women and children in Chiswick, England. What she found, however, was that many of the women coming into her shelter were as violent as the men they were fleeing. Over the years, she also tried to create resources and safe spaces for men, and not just women, but frequently met with indifference and hostility to men's suffering. Nevertheless, it's a passion she continues to hold to this day. For too many years, feminists have been able to demonize men under their artificial argument called patriarchy. Hi, I'm Erin Pitsy, and through working with battered women in my refuges, I saw for myself how violence is passed on from one generation to the next. Quite simply, violent behavior experienced in childhood is often carried forward into adult relationships. Violence is not a gender issue and never was. It's a generational issue. To my amazement, nobody ever wanted to hear why violent people treat each other the way they do. Instead, feminists have had people believe that men are responsible for the violence in our society. There is more than sufficient evidence that both men and women can be equally violent, especially in their personal relationships. But for many years, men and boys have been held to ransom and have been made to live with the lie that they are responsible. The knowledge of the truth has too long been hidden, and this has failed to help women, men, or children. My hope is that the 21st century will see women and men standing shoulder to shoulder to actively take on those who would deny that violence is an issue for everybody. Domestic violence is not, and never has been, a gender issue. On this show, we will be discussing difficult issues and brutal truths. But in truth, there is hope. And in hope, there is healing. Welcome to Revelations with Aaron Pitsy. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the Saturday, May 10th, 2014 episode of Revelations with Aaron Pitsy. I, as usual, am your co-host, Dean Esme, and with me, as always, your host, Aaron Pitsy. How are you doing this uh, today, Aaron? Well, it's one of those wild English, rainy bits of, of wind, bits of all that sort of stuff. But otherwise, it's lovely. I'm in the country staying with friends. So, oh, well, that's I'm very nice. Very happy. Excellent. And you're getting uh, ready to come over to Canada in a couple, yeah, three I'll weeks, aren't you? Yeah, I'll be flying in on, on the 5th. I'll be flying into Toronto, and it'll be the fantastic conference. My very greatest friend, Anne Cools, will be with us. And um, I, I'm just thrilled. Attila will also be there because he's hosting the conference and organizing it. And it'll be full of wonderful people to talk to and listen to. I can't wait to get there. And Aaron is referring to the Toronto Domestic Violence Conference coming up in early June. Anybody who's interested in that should go to www.torontodv.com. That's Toronto, like the city of Toronto, DV as in domesticviolence.com. You'll see stuff there. Marty Feebert is going to be there. We've had him as a guest on our show, and I know she, uh, Aaron really likes him. Miles Groth, Bernard Beck, and yes, Senator Ann Cools from Canada will also be at that conference. So will I, it turns yes, out. Yes, you will. So I can't wait. And yes, uh, Senator Ann Cools will be there. By coincidence, Senator Ann Cools will also be our guest on our uh, on this show on the 24th. So those of you who want to get to know Senator Ann Cools. Uh, before any of that, uh, either the Toronto Conference or the Detroit Conference, might want to look forward to that episode on the 24th here of Revelations with Aaron Pitsy. 
Now, today, uh, we have a very special guest. Uh, before we introduce her, I'll mention that the call-in number for this radio show now, if you wish to call in, is a U.S. number, but it's U.S. 12146666148. And we also have the chat room open if anybody is interested. It's at avoiceformen.com slash chat, C-H-A-T. So we have that going. And in any case, now let me introduce our new guest. Uh, our guest is Neve Farrell. Now, I'm, I quite confess I don't quite understand Irish spelling conventions because it's spelled N-I-M-N-I-A-M-H, but it's pronounced Neve, isn't it, Neve? That's right. Good. Well, how, how are you doing today, Neve? I'm very well, thank you. What's that? I'm very oh, well, excellent. thank you. And just like Aaron, it's it's raining, it's horrible, it's cold. And I'm not in the nice countryside. <laughs> <laughs> well, so be it. I guess I'll make you both uh, jealous and say that it's a very nice, warm, sunny day here in Michigan. But uh, <laughs> in any case, uh, Amen Services is uh, located in um, Meath County, about an hour north of Dublin in Ireland, and was started in, I believe, 1997 uh, by a Mary... About a, by a Mary Cleary uh, was the original founder, if I remember right, and it is currently the only uh, service offering um, a helpline and support services for male victims of domestic abuse in Ireland. Is that is that the gist of it? That is correct. That's right. Yeah, we're the only um, we're the only either funded or not funded organization in the country for specifically for male for men. And yet you've managed to stay alive for since 1997, and that's <laughs> very good to hear. Um, it is, and it is, and so, well, like every other organisation, and I suppose in every country, funding is diminishing rapidly. But we are still here, and we're we're very lucky to be here. Well, uh, just so people know, before we get into asking questions, you can find Amen at. Amen.ie, IE is the Ireland country code, so that's A-M-E-N dot I-E. You can find them on uh, Facebook as at Amen Support Services. So it's uh, they got a Facebook group, Amen Support Services. Uh, you can find them on Twitter at Amen Ireland. That's at Amen Ireland, A-M-E-N Ireland. Uh, so that's how you get a hold of them. I'll even go ahead just in case anybody needs it. The support line, if you're, this, this support line is available is 046-902-3718. What hours do you run that helpline anyway, Neve? The helpline is open Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. So unfortunately we're not open at the weekends. So that's, that's the one big disadvantage. Well, that's all right. And so you do, I understand that you do receive some government funding, uh, at least a small amount, but you're also a charity and you're, you, you take donations, right? We do, absolutely. We absolutely do take donations. And we, every penny of the donations that come in gets put straight back into services for clients. So um, at the moment, we're using any donations we get to um, provide counselling for clients because we actually have no funding for counselling. So all our counselling is being done voluntary at the moment. So you have so volunteers doing counselling for men who we come to you. We have, yeah, we have voluntary counsellors. We have four voluntary counsellors at the moment. Um, and there's a waiting list for counselling here too. So if we had money, we could employ another, we could actually employ a counsellor and pay them to, to clear our backlog. But we just can't do that at the moment. All right. So anybody who's listening who has an ability to help out there, you just got a clarion call and you have no excuse. You know how to get a hold of them. So, Aaron, you, I heard you make a noise. You had a question. Yeah, I was going to say to Neve, what, what's your funding like compared to the refuge funding for women? Mm, well, the <laughs> good question. The funding situation here at the moment, um, we are getting less than 1% of the funding um, in comparison to what the women's groups get. So um, in, in Ireland at the moment, every county in Ireland has a refuge, and in Dublin there's a few refuges. And I'll give no you an example, yeah. The refuge that I used to run in London gets $12 million from the government mm -hmm. a year. Um, uh, it's, and more, it's more than that here now. It's like 40 or 40 million as far as I know. 
and we get the state the funding we get is we get I'll tell you honestly we get 148,000 euro for a year oh, it's disgusting absolutely mm. you know considering now that internationally as you know I don't have to tell you but maybe listeners need to be reminded internationally all the research work proves what I said all those years ago it's not a gender issue it's never been a gender issue it's a family issue and it's generational from one generation down to the other. My people came from County Mayo, and uh, they were a big Irish Catholic family. And my father was, he was born in England, and he was the 17th child of that family. And so on both sides, which are Irish both sides, I can actually trace back three generations of violence and violent behavior in the family. And so that's why I, was, I knew from the very beginning that it was nothing to do with the so-called patriarchy. Now it's a question of everybody, most people now recognize this. It's just a question. And I don't know what you think, Neve, but I think wresting any kind of money out of the women's refuge organization, the radical feminists, is going to be a really hard job. Mm, absolutely. It's it's just a mammoth tax. So just, I, I honestly, I don't know. I mean, it's... In the, like, when people say to me, oh, you work for the only organisation in the country that deals with men, you must have loads of money. That's the perception because people think, well, they know that the, that all the women's groups are, are, are pretty okay in terms of funding. So they assume that we're the same because we're the only organisation for men that we must have loads of money. And it's the complete opposite. And it's just, I don't know how you change people's mindset to think, you know, to inter- understanding and realising that who cares if the victim's a man or woman? Why should it matter? I just, I can't, I can't get my head around this. Why it matters who the victim is and why they're so protective of, of. Okay, fair enough. I completely understand. They fought long and hard. That all the refugees and the women's groups, they fought long and hard to get what they have, and I couldn't take that away from them. But they're holding on to it very carefully, and they don't want to. They don't want to admit that it is possible that a man can be abusive. No, because or abused, they're not. I should say. No, because they're, and then, they're not. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, no. That's what it. Sorry, it's my yeah, fault. Yeah, they don't want to share. Yeah, they don't want yeah. to share. Yeah. That's exactly what's happening. And I mean, and a, and a perfect example of that is there's um there's a national steering committee on violence against women, mm-hmm. and it's um chaired by um, a section of the Department of Justice. Mm-hmm. We approach them. They actually give us some funding every year to do an awareness campaign, and we approach the, the department. Um, they're called CUSC, which means stop. But uh, we approached them and we said, um, it's time that we sat at this table around this National Steering Committee. Not a hope. There was uproar over it. The, um, the, the women's groups and the refugees and so on wouldn't share the table with us at all. So much so that they went and set up a National Steering Committee on Violence Against Men. Who sits at that table? Me. And that's it. Mm. Because there are no other men's groups in the country that are funded. They won't accept people at the table who aren't funded. So, you know, I'm you're very impressed. brave. I'm really pleased you're doing this. Well done. Because it's a lonely business, isn't it? <laughs> it is really lonely. Because I go to meetings and nobody talks to me. <laughs> you know, we want to say where you work. People, people walk by you, you know. They won't stop at your table when you have a stand on you. Where people just keep on going. It is yeah, it's a very lonely place. But in fact, you know, I have to say, though, as time goes on, it, I have... And I've noticed over the last couple of years, I actually have developed a few relationships with individuals that work within um, refuges and and women's aid and so on, because they're they're an individual. They're not looking at it from, oh, I work for women's aid, so I can't talk to anybody else. Um, you know, so sometimes, and I think it's down to individuals a lot of the time too, and that is something that has improved. Even locally now, I have I have developed much better relationships with um, with agencies. But again, it's on a personal level. If you went back to um, to the organisations, there might be a different mindset. Well, the problem in England is if anybody sets up a refuge. Hello. Mhm. Oh, the light's gone. If anybody sets up a refuge uh, and they don't, and then and they allow men to work in the refuge, or they allow. Um, uh, men to sit on the board they can't join the Federation of Women's Aid who control all the finances is it the same there? 
I would imagine, so. I don't know, but I know that there's no men working in any of the refuges and there's no men allowed into the refuges, so I imagine it's the same thing then, isn't it? I'd imagine so, yeah. See, that's a tragedy because we always had men uh, working in the refuges because we recognised how important it was for the children who'd never mm -hmm. often mm -hmm. hadn't known good gentlemen mm -hmm. and also for the mothers. We actually often have that conversation here because the the, the way it was set up, a man is that obviously it was set up by a woman, which defies mm. logic to start off with. But um, the the current structure in a man is I'm the manager, I'm female, mm -hmm. obviously. Our two full time support workers are female. Our two part time support workers are male, and our we have four counsellors. Two are female, two are male, and our board is a mixture. It's probably half and half. Well, that's wonderful. So there's a complete balance right mm. through the organisation. Because it began, I think, with Nula Fennell. And this is in the 70s. I was invited to go over, and the first refuge started in Harcourt Terrace. It's an enormous place, very, very derelict, but full of women and kids. And it was an ex-priest who actually was the driving force. And then I think they'd all got hijacked. And then what happened is that they all got booted out, and the whole thing went into the radical feminist hands because they need the funding and right. uh, and they that's what funds actually the radical feminist movement in Ireland and that pays not only for refugees but actually for top heavy administration of the refugees so you don't just have the refugees with the mothers in it you then have all the staff and the outreach workers and then on top of that you get domestic violence forums and that's how it all gets spent. Mm. And it's not healthy. And it's not right either. Now, let's go back to, I mean, I know in the days when I used to come over to Mary Cleary's conferences, the tremendous problems that uh, men were having of getting divorces at all. Because you're a very Catholic country, aren't you? Mm, absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's that you have to be separated four out of five years to get a divorce. Hmm. And I just remember the Catholic priests coming into my refuge and go, trying to go up to the women and saying, if you're a Catholic woman, you should be back home because you made your bed, you took your vows and you must lie on it. How heavy is that where you are? Not Certainly the Catholic Church have no say now anyway, that's for sure. Um, hmm. No, I don't think there's the same mindset now, in fairness. Um, Obviously, it's very different um, for the men with the situation. So, like, it depends. You know, sometimes people in more rural areas um, may often come here and say, look, geez, I married her now. I can't leave her. We're married for life, and that's it. Some people, but mm. it would be few. A lot of people would, would, would understand that if the, if the situation is no longer um, viable or, or they can't put up with it anymore, that, they can they can separate it. It's not that it's not an option anymore. And would you say that your that your um, judiciary? I mean, our problem in in England is our judiciary has really been feminised uh, to such an extent that women are given a free ride in the courts, and the courts mm. discriminate against fathers. Mm. Well, uh, the thing that we find here all the time is that there's no. Um, there are no consequences for women. They're, they're not penalised through the courts. Um, I mean, I'm working here seven years, and I can think of two cases in seven years where a woman was imprisoned for constant breach of orders and so on. So they don't. There's no, there's no consequences if you're a woman and you're abusive. I think that, that's, a, yes, that's, that's roughly what's happening here as well. Yeah. And the other great problem that we have here is that um, if women want to, play the alienation game against the fathers. Mm. Oh, yeah, uh, that's so um, horrible, yeah. Um, yeah, that's child abuse as far as I'm concerned. Oh, oh gosh, yeah. And um, we get a lot of men um, here saying, I can't, she told me, we say he says he's leaving, and she says, that's fine, if you leave um, and you say that you're being abused and so on, I'm going to say that you've abused the children. And yeah. that just, that's the most horrible, horrific thing anyone could ever say or use against a man. And it's what happens, uh, this I know Canada was a really eye opener for me because my mother was Canadian and she was very violent. Um, but what what struck me was there uh, they call it hoovering because a man comes home from work and he finds the house empty, the wife's gone, 
mm. and the police won't tell him where she is. Yeah. All they'll say yeah. is she's safe. So he doesn't, and there was no yeah. goodbye probably, and stuff's Absolutely. missing from the house. Yeah. She then gets into the refuges where she's yeah. told she's a victim. Whatever yeah. she's done, she's a victim. And then mm -hmm. if that doesn't work fast enough, to either get him out of the house or get rehoused. They call it the silver bullet, just as you said. That's when she goes for, well, he's molested the children. Yeah. That's, and yeah, then he you've, loses, you've hit, that's the exact same, yeah. And he loses everything. Exactly. So and you see it all, you see, you see all this about it exactly the same in Ireland then is what I'm hearing yeah, then. Yeah, it's the exact same. I mean, the, the amount of men that ring here after re reporting kids and wives missing to, to the to the guardy or to the police here, and the guards tell them they're safe. He doesn't know where they are. I mean, we had one man who who had reported his kids and wife missing, and then later found that he was actually a policeman himself. Later found out that they were in a refuge, and he didn't see his kids for months, at mm. months and months before he got to see those kids. Yeah, he had, had, he, had he had he been abused by her? Absolutely. Yeah, really badly physically abused. Yeah, and he a member of the police force. He's a member of the police force. Yeah. Uh, I I don't I I I, I'm, I I don't know why I I don't. I actually wonder sometimes why more members of the police force don't speak up, but maybe their 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 they jobs. They lose their are jobs. The they lose their jobs. But of the, all the people you talk to, and certainly in England, my experience of the police is all the police I deal with, and I deal with them constantly. They absolutely understand and know because they go to, to houses where they know that the wife is the one who's done done the damage. But they're in a position where, they, in many cases, they're mandated to arrest the man. It's getting better. It's actually getting better in England. It's very, very slowly. Various yeah. agencies are beginning to realize that they can't go on like this. Yeah. There's, it's pretty there's much groups. the same here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're not too, um, they're not, they don't arrest them, but what they'll do is they say, oh, have you anywhere else you can go tonight? Now, unless there's orders in place, if there's court orders in place, that's different. But if there's no court orders in place, and even if there's blood pouring out of him, and she's crying in the corner, they say to him, oh, have you anywhere else you could stay tonight just till this blows over? I know. And, and what, uh, take me through it then, Mary, because as, as odd as it sounds, uh, I'm sorry, Neve, sorry. <laughs> Take me through this, Neve. Um, uh, so, I mean, as odd as it sounds, I mean, I know you, the situation is tough for you. You're very short on resources, but actually, you're ahead of the game from a lot of uh, other countries. In Canada, there's nothing. In the United mm. States, there's almost nothing. In the UK, there's some of the people who work for Aaron. But what does it? T so, so, I think you were telling me you don't actually have any refuges that you can offer, no. right? No, there's no refuge you, here for men at all. So if a man contacts here and he is in dire need of accommodation, if he rings on a Monday, he's in a better position than if he rings on a Friday. Because on a Monday or Tuesday, uh, he has a chance to go to speak to um, the housing department in the local council. And they may, depending on the person he meets on the day, put him in, in emergency accommodation, which would be a hostel or a B&B, &B, and then um, for a few nights. Now, however, if he owns a home... I don't know what this is like in the UK, but if he owns a home and has a mortgage or has a property in his name, he is not considered homeless, regardless. So his, his leg can be hanging off or his head could be falling off, but if he has a home in his name, he is not considered homeless and therefore is not entitled to rent allowance or rent supplement or any sort of rent support from the government whatsoever. So he's left his home, he has nowhere to go, and they won't house him. So what do do? So I'm curious, I mean, this sounds painful, but okay, I, I'm going to pretend I'm calling you now, and I'm going to yeah. tell you that my wife is, has, has hit me over the head with a wine bottle, and uh, I just got out of the hospital, I've got stitches, uh, I'm afraid to go home, uh, but I'm also afraid because I've got two children there, and mm. I don't know what to do. Where would you start advising me? Did you, are you married, uh, did you say? On that. I, 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 um, okay, because no, she's my girlfriend. Difference. All right, she, okay. okay. Right. I'll say she's my girlfriend. So she's your girlfriend. Been... Okay, yeah, because that, that makes a big difference here. If you're not married, first of all, you have no legal rights over those children. Really? So you cannot, yeah. So unless you, and, and the, the next thing I hear is, oh, but my name is on the birth cert. It means nothing. 
in Ireland, if you do not have a piece of paper that you got signed by your girlfriend and you signed it in front of a solicitor, a commissioner for oaths, or in the district court, you have no legal rights over your children whatsoever. So assuming you don't have that piece of paper, because most don't when they ring here, um, you can't take those children anywhere with you anyway. So even if there was a state-of-the-art refuge around the corner from you, you can't take your children if you do not have guardianship of them. You have no legal rights over them. So you'll have to leave your children behind you, first of all. Um, the second thing, so we've established that you don't have guardianship, so you're leaving your kids behind you now. So you have to leave those kids with an abusive woman. Um, you will spend the night in your mom's, in your sister's, in your car, in your garden shed, wherever you like, because there's nowhere else for you to go, or you go back to her and see what else she has to throw at you tonight. You can go to the police or the guards, as we call them, the guardie here, um, and report it, but there's nothing they can do. They're not going to go and arrest her. Unless perhaps you've got some kind of proof that she's currently <laughs> hurting the children, there's really nothing. Unless, well, exactly, yeah, but chances are dependent. Oh, that's a whole other thing with the children. If she's abusing the children, um, then we have to start making child protection referrals to social workers. Um, depending on the severity of the abuse, social workers are so under-resourced here. If, you are, if you're physically abusing your children um, and I send off a referral, a social worker might contact you in a week. Um, if the abuse is not that severe towards the children, you might never hear from a social worker or you could be put on a waiting list so it really depends. If you don't reach, they have thresholds, and it depends on where on the thresholds the, the your case falls, or what they make of your case, whether they'll investigate it or not. So mm. I'm an unmarried man. I have no rights over my children no. uh, whatsoever. No rights so. And so it's very hopeless. So that's why, and that's how we end up referring so many people to the suicide agencies. Do you know what your suicide figures are? Say that again, sorry? Do you know what your suicide figures are for... for, for no, but I know that 40-something... 40, 40 I was at actually I was at a conference about it. Um, mm. There was a... Um, oh, there was an, a community partnership group. Actually, at the moment, what we're doing in Ireland at the moment is we have this thing called a Green Ribbon Campaign, and it's about mm -hmm. um, increasing awareness on mental health and getting conversations started about mental health. So the month of May is is Mental Health Month, Awareness Month, and there's a green ribbon campaign which we're involved in because so many of our men will tell us about how they've contemplated suicide and they can't see another way out. So um, that's why we got involved with this and we're going to be handing out these green ribbons to people. But the suicide rate, I actually, I know that I, I know on the model that we actually have a low suicide rate, but when, per capita, but when you look at the um, the age group and the profile of people like we're way up there in Europe third from the mm. top or something in terms of mm. it's me mostly men obviously we far higher suicide rate of men and the age group of men is really disturbing they're like from teenagers to 30 that's the highest suicide rate in in, um, in Ireland and yeah, certainly in England it's four men to one woman commit suicide yeah yeah and yeah, in my it's very experience similar. Yeah, the more my in my experience, most of the suicides are when a man's lost his family, mm. and uh, and certainly it happened in my refuge because one of the fathers came and parked the car uh, at the bottom of the refuge. Uh, we always saw all the men, and we had facilities to help men. And I used to run charity shops called Men's Aid to raise money to pay people to help men. But he didn't even get that far. He killed himself in the car around the corner. And I remember a young policeman coming in and saying, is Mrs. Emma Butler there? And she said, yes. And he said, I've got something to tell you. And she said, uh, he said, would you like to sit down? And she said, no. He said, I'm afraid your husband's committed suicide. And she looked at him straight in the eye and said, thank God for that. Mm. And he had to sit down, actually, because he was quite young. And uh, it, I just looked at the whole situation and thought, this thing's really, really have to change. And that's 40 mm. years ago. Yeah. And so, all right, let me, let me, let me. I'll okay, go back so, to your case, yeah. Okay, going back, yeah, going back to just my case. So, I mean, what you're, what you're probably going to do for me um, is, is refer me maybe to some counseling. 
and mm-hmm. and otherwise, I guess, just help me strategize how to cope with my yeah. life under these circumstances. Yeah. yeah. So what we was what we've been encouraging you to do is to go to the district court tomorrow, we'll say, or or today if it's not late in the evening, and apply for some protection from the court. You can apply for a protection order and a safety order or a bar and order, um, to which would have her to look to have her removed from the home. So that's what we would be suggesting. But most of the time, the men don't do the things, do this thing because they're thinking of their children at home with this woman, um, and they just go back. All right. Let's let's let's. Oh God. And then if they do go back, do you still have some? quiet support services that you can give them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of them that will go back will have ongoing support to the house. Like, see, it depends on what part of the country they're in too. I know it's not a huge country, but, you know, if they're then the way in the south of the country, which could be maybe a, a six-hour drive from where we are, um, it's generally only over the helpline. Now, if they're li- closer to us, we can do an awful lot more. So, um we would have them regularly on the phone, but regularly ca- calling into the office to speak with a support worker on a one-to-one basis. We'd get them into counselling here as well. Um, and we have two lots of counselling, some counselling that goes on during the day and some in the evening times. So depending on what, what suits them and how they can get out of the house or whatever the case may be. We have group meetings and um, we actually, something we started new this year, um, we've actually started cookery courses for men, cookery classes. Um, for men who might be newly separated or men that are, like, we have a lot of people that are living in the same house as their wife or their partner, but they don't cook, to, she won't cook for them or they don't eat together or whatever. Or for men who maybe have access to children now and need to cook for them. So we've actually started doing that this year now. We've got funding to do that from a private donor. And it's absolutely to one teach of men the most successful cook. things. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's working fantastically. I can't, really? It's, it's really, it's, yeah, it's amazing. I didn't think it was going to work at all, to be honest. I had really severe reservations about it. But it's absolutely brilliant. You should see the way they communicate with each other. And yeah, that's they love the I, social aspect of yeah, it. Yeah, that's I think is brilliant because it's so hard for men to socialise over mm. emotional issues. Yeah, but if and this is like, I, I saw them in action, you know, they're stirring pots and frying things and yet they're talking. Yeah. And they come out of it in great humour. They're full and, mm. you know, they, they realize that there's six or seven other people in the room that know exactly what they're going through, and yet they might need mm. to be talking about it. And, that, and, and, also they, and they're honored that they can actually contact each other. Yeah. yeah. So well, there's, a, there's something, that I mean, actually, now that you say it, that does sound brilliant. I remember I've, uh, we mm. had Tom Golden on this. Uh, he's a psychotherapist who deals with men, and he'll tell you uh, men don't sit around and emote very well. They're just not very good at it, as a yeah. rule. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if they have a task, they're, yeah. they're, they they didn't all Absolutely. of a sudden open right the heck up. Mm. It doesn't even yeah. seem to matter that much what the task is. Mm. Cooking sounds brilliant. Why not? Here's how mm. you're going to learn how to cook. And yeah. um, they're, they're learning a skill. They're talking. I'm, and I'm guessing it's exactly what you just said. They're joking. They're, yeah. they're sharing their experiences. There seems to be something in male psychology. They need to be doing something mm. yeah. and formulating yeah, and, some and, plan of action. Yeah, absolutely, and it was just, I I sat and, and observed that the, the, on one of the nights that they were doing it, and it went on for six weeks, that, that particular one, and um, I, was, I was blown away, I really was, when I saw the, the banter and the fun they were having, and they were so proud of themselves because they were being encouraged, and the, nobody was putting them down, or nobody was watching them, or, you know, they just loved this, I, I was such a success, I'm just, we're ready to start the second lot now, um, we can't do it until we have about six or seven men. It's not worth our while with less than that. So we're just waiting for one or two more men to confirm, and then we'd be ready to go with the second lot. So I'm looking forward to that now, too, I have to say. And actually, so, when those men were finished, they asked us. They, one of them said, actually, two of them came up to me afterwards and said, um, would it be very girly if we asked you, w- w- would it be possible for her to show us how to bake cakes? <laughs> I said, I don't see why not. And he said, oh, maybe we could come back later in the year and she could show us, we could do a few classes on how to bake cakes. I thought, well, there you go. Why not? And learn to yeah, bake bread while you're at it. Why yeah, not? yeah. Um, oh, I think that's that's brilliant. That's something uh, other groups that are working I'm with. I'm very proud of it now, I have to on. say. Yeah. Really? Uh, well, you should be. Um, so, okay, I guess I'll just go back to my, my okay, let's let's back up with my 
already horrible story, and let's pretend I was married. How would that be different in uh, in Ireland? Well, at least if you're married, you have legal rights over your children, so you, you're entitled to know where they are. Um, so from the very beginning, from when those children are born, you're entitled to know um, uh, what school they go to, what religion they are, um, their medical information. Um, and again, in terms of you know taking them out of the country, you'd have say you'd have a say over that passports and so on. That's actually just on that point. That's that's a big thing now at the moment. We have a huge amount of people here, um, in relationships with foreign nationals, and it's a disaster when the when the relationships break down because yeah. the children being. We have a lot of Eastern Europeans here, a huge number of Polish people, and um, we have lots of Irish men with Polish girlfriends and. Um, uh, taking kids out of the country back to Poland and Romania and Lithuania and all sorts of places and it's just a disaster trying to get those kids back from those countries so um, this is the thing Leif. do you find I, I find the Hague Convention doesn't really work yeah I know some, in, most of them in theory, to... in theory it's great I mean we actually had one man whose children and it's, it, it's, it's different they were in China oh my mm. god <laughs> Mm. He he spent six months in China with a private investigator trying to find those kids. Did, did that get paid for by the Hague Convention? I don't think so. Ah, so if he hadn't had money, he wouldn't have had a chance. Yeah. Because that's now, look, you know, he, he was, he's an engineer, and what he did was he got work over there. Okay. So he was able to work when he was there. But six months, he did, he did find them and um, eventually, and he decided that he would stay in China for a couple of years. Um, to watch them growing up a little bit. So now he kind of spends half his year in China and half his year here because she won't bring the kids back here. <sighs> See, my, my mm, problem the kids is the, Hague, here. the problem with the Hague Convention, uh, the only time I've ever seen it actually work was when it was a very, very violent father and the mother had fled the country with the children, mm. which immediately made her the perpetrator. And, mm. and she managed to get to England and get to me. And then he applied under the Hague Convention because under re- that they were resident in, in Canada. So the mm-hmm. English taxpayers paid for this violent man. And the judge said, this is one of the most violent men I've ever come across. Stood in court and paid for by British taxpayers, everything. The flights, yeah. all the lawyers, all the accommodation to try and get these children handed back to a virtual maniac of a man. Yeah. Anyway, to cut a long story short, we won that one. But the other point I wanted to make was that in England, we got the law changed. So now, automatically, the father of the child, yes, he's on the birth certificate and it gives him equal rights to the mother. Yeah, that, that's what we need to do here. Or, we need to do I that. Mean, yeah, absolutely, without a doubt. I, I can't understand why. Like, I know when I had my child, they come round to you in the bed in the hospital to fill in the form, to, reg- to the, the initial registration of your child's birth. Now, if they can't, if that form, for whatever reason, can't be the the form for guardianship, can can that person that comes to the bed not have another form for guardianship and Mm. get the two parents when they're there, when everything's nice and happy and they're all delighted with their new baby, to sign the form and then that's the job done? Yeah, that's how it should be. Yeah, it makes perfect sense to me, but I can't, I just can't understand. And people do not know this. No, nobody knows this that they don't have rights until the relationship breaks down. Breaks down, yeah. And yeah. actually, it, I don't know about you, but and I'm sure Dean will have something to say about his it, what's happening in America. Most men don't have any idea because men no, they don't. Haven't clue. They don't communicate with each other. No. See, women will tell each other Absolutely. this is what's happening. This is, and men don't. So suddenly no. they wake no. up, everything's gone, and that's why they kill themselves because yeah. it, everything evaporates on them, and they've got no tools to work with. Yeah. I, uh, the, this is, in the United States, it's, well, the states are a little more complicated because there's, uh, as most people probably know, there's 50 states and, mm. and, and laws are different from state to state, sometimes rather dramatically. So it's harder to speak generically of the American experience. But in, uh, as for, for example, I happen to know in Oregon, they have some fairly enlightened policies, not perfect, but, but fairly enlightened, um, Whereas as, as some place like uh, uh, Pennsylvania, you might as well not even be a human being. You're going to have no rights if you're a man. Um, the uh, but 
Uh, one thing I definitely find is a constant is that no man believes that things are like this until it happens to them mm. or somebody close to them. They just don't believe it, and I don't know how much of that is social conditioning and how much of that is I, – I don't know. But convincing men that it's a serious problem is that way. And then, of course, when they seek help, they are stunned that there's nothing there for them mm. or that they may actually be sneered at or even – and this to me is the worst. I've seen this multiple times – they will get referred to anger management classes where they're told oh, that yeah. they're abusers and yeah. where they're going to help be helped to overcome their abuse issues. Now, it's probably true that a lot of them may have anger issues, but it's certainly not all of them. And uh, the man's just got out of the hospital because his wife set him on fire and, here, you need to go to anger management. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, it's, it's, it can be quite brutal. Can be mm. quite brutal. It's, it's the same here. There's no. Um, there's a fantastic perpetrators program in Ireland for men that are abusive. It's brilliant. I have to say, it's first class. But there's none for women. There's none for women. No, no it doesn't. So, yeah, I, I, that's crazy because we know there are, abu- uh, are abusive women, and and uh, even yeah, apart I'm from also... abusive, even apart from abusive women in in a relationship at home, there are manipulative women in every in every aspect of society whether it's be at work or whoever and there are women that need to overcome violence in all in all sects of society so there's it's not just a need for um for a perpetrator program for women who are violent in their relationship i mean if you're out on a saturday night and you see what do you see you see girls pulling hair and kicking each other around the streets and and nobody passes any heat of that so i mean what are they? What are they doing at home if they're doing that on the street? So I mean, there is a need for a perpetrator for or anger management classes or whatever you want to call it for women in general. But the problem but, is that you see the 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 thinking and the and the brainwashing for forty years has been the radical feminist ideology, which says if a woman's retaliating in a relationship, it's yeah. because it's in self defence. Yeah. Therefore, she she all women are innocent are victims of male violence. That's the mantra. So therefore, there's no room. And it's quite interesting because I remember being in Canada in Windsor, Ontario. They had a brilliant program for men who who needed help with anger management. And they didn't use that dreadful Duluth model, which is a monstrous okay. thing. They were really good. But the, the women there came and said, well, can we have our own meetings? Because most domestic violence is shared. Most mm. in those couples, both are violent and violent mm. to the children, and that women then had their own project, and I actually sat in on their meetings, and it was fantastic. And that's such a healthy way to work with domestic violence yeah. because it's not it, yet occasionally forty percent is either the man or the woman is an innocent victim and by accident get involved with the violent people, but sixty percent. Both sides are violent, and they've mostly experienced violence in childhood. So really, mm. it needs yeah. to be dealt with in counselling, in therapy, and people need to be given the tools other than violence to react to stress and pain. But you see, exactly, and it goes back to the original point of that, why is it a gender issue? I mean, we should be having a whole family approach to domestic violence so that if an agency comes in, they can sort mom, sort dad, and sort the children, regardless of who's doing the abuse to who. That it's a whole family approach and then everybody right. gets the, the assistance they need, rather than sending mom to this place, sending dad 100 miles to another place, and, and forgetting about the children. Mm, I think that's absolutely true. But then you have to remember the whole reason this all happened is because in 1974, and the group from Ireland who were running the refuge in Ireland were at that meeting, it was invaded by a very, very powerful group of Marxist feminists from across England, and they voted themselves into the National Federation of Women's Aid, and they were radical feminists, not because they were interested in domestic violence, but they wanted a just cause and they wanted funding. And Mm. the idea of battered women as victims very good funding there and then and also they were able to raise it's now a billion dollar industry as you say yeah. there's millions going into the refugees in Ireland and nothing going towards the men mm. there actually there was a um, only a few weeks ago there was one of the women's refuges here closed 
Um, really? In yeah, yeah, in Loud, which would be, it's kind of to the east of us, north of Dublin as well. It's it's the smallest county in Ireland, but there was two refuges in it. Now it would have a huge population, it was a very densely populated county, but they had two refuges in it, and one of them was closed there um, a few weeks ago. Why? And they still have the support services in Everton, but they don't have the refuges. But this is bothering me because this is what's happening. They're actually, they are closing refuges because I've been involved with a couple, one in Weymouth and one in Devon, and the, the money is being put in. This is what's frightening. The government are putting the money into support services instead of refuges. Now, you tell me, let's say a woman is in a very violent situation and in fear of her life. Nobody can visit her because she'd get killed. Yeah, exactly. So what's the support, what's, what's the support mm. service about? Mm. I think, and I've always said this, I have always said that we have to be very careful because no governments want to actually deal with this problem. They would rather mm. it goes under the carpet with more agencies paid to keep it under the carpet like mm. it was when I first started. Yeah, well, actually, now, this year what's happened is um, we have a new system now. We've been taking, there's a new agency being set up, in that, a, a government agency called the Child and Family Agency. And all the, the refuges, all the support, everything to do with children and families has been taken over by this. And there's a new minister assigned to it. So the Minister for Children, which was a woman up until last week, but she's gone to be the Minister for Justice now. So we've a new Minister for Justice and a new Minister for Children. So I, I wonder how. Now. But listen, but the, all these new agencies—they take money away from a roof over desperate men and women's heads. Mm. There's no yeah. roofs for men, but there are yeah. desperate women, and, they're, they're, and yeah. all these—they're they're institutionalizing the whole thing. So mm. it just become a bureaucracy. But what we've been taken them. out of the health system. See, we were in the, the domestic violence was in the health system, which is where you should move. Yeah, but it's been taken out of the health system now and put into the child and family agency. So the, the, because we've been taken over by the child and family agency now, or our funding comes from there now, um, our focus as an organisation has shifted slightly. We have to um, now do more for the children of the family as, uh, as well as the dad. So originally when dad would have rang here, we'd say we would have asked all the necessary questions in relation to him. And we would have asked about the children too, but they would have been secondary to him because our mm. primary focus was to sort him out. But now our focus has to be him and the children. So we have to put in place measures to protect those children as best we can as an organisation, which is very hard considering we have no access to the children because going back to Dean's situation where he's not married, so he can't bring his children in here even if he wanted to. So um, it's very hard to do. What you're trying to do is you're trying to, trying to sort out children when you don't know them. What's well, you know what, let me, let, ladies, let me interrupt for a quick minute and, and clarify something uh, very important. Uh, I was giving Neve a hypothetical example of Dean. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> nothing like that. And, uh, you know, I, I deal with men who have gone through things like this. I just wanted to make sure, you know, my ex-wife may be listening. No, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> this is, we are not talking about me. I was giving a hypothetical. So just okay. so everybody What knows. I wanted to say to you that bothers me, Neve, in England... Because of the, the, the new legislations, as you say, what's happening now is if a woman is involved with a, a violent man and for any reason she, he finally leaves, then she's, the children are, and she are in, in, in the hands of social services. And mm -hmm. if social services come in and they suspect that she's even had connection with the father of the children, they'll take the children off her. Mm -hmm. We, there are more and more children, and the rates getting bigger and bigger, are actually being taken into care, fostered or adopted. And this is a very frightening way to go. Mm -hmm. So I'm scared that it's going to go back to what it was 40 years ago, women not being able to leave. Because if they do, they, they, they go into the threat of not just losing their homes and everything, mm -hmm. but also losing their children. Well, on that point, and we're coming on at a very different angle, but... Now that we're making um, people, or because we're asking more questions about the children, mm. um, there is the potential that we're going to lose clients because they're going to be, what the hell? Why is she asking me all these questions? I'm busy taking notes on dates of birth and places of birth and mother's names and dresses mm. and all this sort of stuff to get social workers involved. Um, now, fair enough, we would have had to do that anyway, but not on the scale that we're doing it now. 
Mm. Um, so, you know, there is that there is that fear every time I, I ask people about their children that they're going to hang up and that they're not going to come back to us because they're thinking, oh, my God, she's going to get social workers involved. Yeah. And I now, in fairness, social what? workers aren't as quick here to go in and put the kids out. Um, yeah. y- there, there's a process and it's much longer. And But anyway, um, but there is that fear. I mean, and here, if a child is under one, it's an automatic referral to social workers if there's domestic violence in the family. Hmm. So, because obviously, so a lot of men have is, to fear that might happen if they even do talk to you. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. But the only thing is, I don't think a lot of them know that. Most people don't know that. Um, so, I mean, I spoke to a man um, on Friday, no, Thursday, who um, had a, a baby that was a month old. And, um, I mean, I was, he's actually coming to meet us on a one-to-one then this week coming. But um, he, I didn't tell him on the phone that I'm going to be making a child protection referral. Because if I did, he wouldn't come. So, wait a minute, you had to do what now? I didn't quite catch that. I'd have to make a child protection referral about his situation once I get all the details from him. He was very cagey on the phone. He didn't want to give very much. But when he actually comes to meet us, we will have to make a child protection referral about his... So how do you explain that to him? I know, I know. How am I going to do that? That's the thing. Um, but, well, the, the thing is, here, when, when there's a baby so small, um, a public health nurse should be associated or affiliated with the family anyway because once a woman comes home from hospital, so the public health nurse goes to visit them a few times. Mm-hmm. Um, so she obviously or as soon as the she, the social, the, the health nurse, obviously didn't catch on to anything being wrong in the house, which is quite normal, I suppose they wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, um, they wouldn't. yeah exactly, because everything's going to be rosy when the, so, when mm. the public health nurse comes. Um, so it could be, it could go back to her, I assume, once I make my referral, because the child is so small, that she will be the one that will have to be going back and seeing if the family are okay before it goes into social I don't know what's going to happen, because so he, may, he may get up and walk out, but if I have enough details at all, I'll have to make the referral. Or just do your best to reassure him that this yeah, is something yeah. you have to do and that it's actually going to be in his best interests. Because yeah. at least Tans the child... That they... Yeah, and Tans yeah. Tans social workers won't do anything anyway because he, he was very adamant to me on the phone. He's, I said to him, what sort of mom is she? How is she with the baby? No, so she's very good. He said, I have no... He said, she's really lovely with the baby and so on. So, chances are social workers aren't going to get involved. But still, post-call, it has to be done. So he's, I can't he's, make that decision. So she's just violent to him? Yeah. So far. The baby mm. is only a month old. Yeah, it's only four weeks old. But you know, old. this is your typical situation. He's married five years, or six years, and they're together about 15 years. And uh, he said he knew he should never have married her. Mm. But she was always like that, and he shouldn't have married her. But he thought if he married her, it might improve. And then oh, well. the age old, the age old story. Oh, if we have a child, everything might yeah. get better. Yeah. yeah. How many? Can I ask you? How many times would you say, with you listening to men talking about the women that they're with, how many times would you think that the women actually do have personality disorders? Oh, a lot of times. Yeah. See, that's what oh, I've my always God. said. Yeah. Yeah. And the and thing, and, and the more time, the more you talk to them. I, I, in recent years, I'm more inclined to ask about um, what sort of a family is she from? What's her family like? Mm. And mm. um, there's, there's nearly always a problem. Like There, there is always a problem. They, they don't have a lovely family where everything's really happy. There's always a problem. She has a sister that's separated or a brother that's separated or both. She's got a mother and father that are unhappily married or separated. There's always, or somebody's drinking or somebody's doing drugs or somebody's doing something. Always. You know, what? I just I very quickly realized that there were two separate issues. Women coming in who were genuinely, and this just applies to men as well, innocent victims of their partner's yeah. violence by accident. They they don't need that much. They need time, they need refuge, and they need a lawyer, yeah. and they yeah. need to get on their feet. It's the women who've come into the refuge who were victims of their own childhood violence. They're the mm. ones that needed long-term support, long-term You're absolutely help. right. Yeah, we yeah. were only actually talking about this, um, about the counselling process with these men. Um, mm. The client that comes in, that, like you say, who has, who has been abused, by his partner, who but he doesn't have any underlying issues, if you like. Mm. Part, I don't mean Himself, don't say yeah. flippant about it, but um, they, like you say, you can you can sort them out in, in maybe yeah. six or eight counselling sessions. Yeah. But the ones that have extended or or complex issues, they could be in counselling for two years. 
Yeah, yeah. We see. I had residential accommodation that would go up for yeah. five if necessary. Yeah, and that's what we need. We have to have a complete rethink about generational violence within families. Mm. We do, and no one is. We're only just beginning to talk about it. Mm. But I am optimistic. I am optimistic mm. because Good. with the new child and family agency, if we're we see this child that I'm talking about, that's a month old now. Mm. If we can get in there at a month old. Mm. And do something and put mm. put things in place. For that. Like they have, there's all new um, family resource centres with family therapies, therapists and support workers and family resource workers and every type of worker you can ever think of. And if, if, those, if those resources can work effectively together, well then that's, in my opinion, how that month-old baby won't end up the abuser or the abused. Well, well the father... I'm, very optimi- I'm being optimistic. Yeah, but will the father be included in all these programs? Yes. Oh, good. The only problem is, the only problem is, father will be, yeah, in, th- in that case, definitely, because they're married anyway, but um, the only problem where you run into, the only thing is, if one person um, is not willing to engage, there, we have a whole new thing, because we've been taking over the child and family agency, we have a whole new referral system. It's called, it's like a multi-agency approach to a family, so you can, you can, you can take, um, people from different agencies and bring them all together and put a holistic family um, uh, solution for for them. But if one parent doesn't agree to it, the whole thing can fall apart. Well, that, well that's ridiculous. It's not even going mm. to get off the ground. Because now, these... it can't, to start the process, you only need one parent's um, permission and consent and so on. Okay, but so now, the, but the, the only thing is, it's... if it's offered again and again and mother or father or whoever say, no, I refuse to this, I refuse to that, blah, 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 blah. Um, then the social workers, it'll go back to social workers because social workers can say, why, why does mum not want to engage or why does dad not want to engage or whatever, whoever the abuser is. And so um, it will go back. But we've done three of them. They've only come in since January and we've done three of them. And we've got um, two men on, on um, parenting courses to help them with teenagers because they're separating and teenagers with separations is really messy so we've two men on parenting courses the man is engaged with um youth advocacy program so what they do is they assign a youth worker to the child in the family to help the child so the child doesn't go off off the rails and drop out of school and so on so um so the three that we have done are being followed at the moment so we see how it goes but there's an awful lot of time and effort going into those three families when you think about we could have 300 men, potential men, yeah. that we could do these with. And, 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 how, and at least some men with a roof over their head. Because yeah, yeah. The, women's, the women are okay because they've got the houses. Mm, the, mm. the guys have got nowhere to go. And, and if they're working because they're trying to at least keep body and yeah. soul together, they can't yeah. attend the courses. I, this yeah. is not being thought through, actually, has it? No. And of those, of those three particular men that I'm, I'm just talking about there, one of them is going from his home to his brothers to his sisters and back home. And once, like, they have safety orders and all sorts of things against each other. But um, because, of course, once he got one, she had to retaliate and get one and went in and cried and got one. So um, every time she threatens to use the safety order and she's going to call the guards and whatever, he just packs the bag and goes to save his brothers. Mm. So, oh. I don't know. But at least, look, Do you, I think, go on. Well, I had a question. Uh, uh, do you find that with the law, okay, I, I, I already know your answer is probably going to be yes, because so you, you, you've already more or less said so. Most of the ones that you deal with, uh, the majority have a long-term history of abuse in their backgrounds, right? That's, you find that is a very common thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, do you find that uh, the men in particular? I don't know. I guess you don't deal too much with women, but I, I'm curious. Do you have? Do you find that men uh, that you deal with often even have trouble recognizing that there's abuse going on until something really drastic happens? Oh yeah. When you know they what ring I mean? here, uh, one of the things I yeah. often find is they don't. Go ahead. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. When they ring here. Um, uh, we would say, oh, what type of abuse um, are you suffering at the moment and what the situation is there? Oh, well, I'd say, to it's a physical abuse. Oh, no, no, no. It's, um, she shouts, she screams, she throws things around. And then as the conversation goes, in, goes on, then they'll say, oh, well, um, you know, that night that we were shouting or she was shouting and she threw a cup at me and um, I cut my finger and blah, blah, blah. So I say, so she was physically abusive. There is physical abuse. Oh, yeah, but it was only a couple of times. 
So they don't. They 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 seemed which which I thought was was um, was strange at the beginning was that they they recognised verbal abuse and psychological abuse, but didn't recognise physical abuse, which was really strange to me. And the more I talk to people, the more men I talk to, they say, "Oh no, it was only that one time that she smacked me or that she threw a shoe at me or whatever." But if a, if a if a man started smacking and throwing shoes at women, everybody's going to know that's physical abuse. Yeah. Hello. Oh, hi. Hello. Sorry, uh, we're getting pretty quiet here. Um, so, um, one of the things you've told me, Neve, is that you have seen some support from politicians, um, but we did. and they actually do sometimes come out and seek your support. But yes, then they do. Nothing much happens. Yeah, but again, it's it's on a, it's it's a lot of times on a local level. You know the um. The, the, the local politicians know we're here, and I have to say they're very supportive of us, and they will donate to us if there's money going or anywhere, we will get it. And um, we're included in things, and they'll come and visit the centre, and they've helped a few of our men in recent times sort out accommodation and so on. So, But again, that's on a local level. I don't know if I go to the south or the west of the country and look to speak to a politician. They've probably never even heard of us. So it's not, it's not, it's not a national thing. And you've not found anything partisan about this. I mean, for example, I know that uh, in Australia, Barry Williams has told me that generally speaking, the Liberal Party is a little more supportive of men's issues uh, than, say, their Labour Party. Um, but mm. that's Australia. But you're saying you have no, you're not even perceiving a partisan difference there. You just see a difference across the board, maybe some mm. word of mouth. Yeah, no, it's not, it's not really a party happens. thing. Yeah, no, it's not a party thing, definitely not, no, it's just, it's it's a local, it's on a local level, it's at the local, regardless, I mean, regardless of whether the politicians here in the, in the town, for example, are, are, um, are in government or not, they are, or what party they are affiliated to, they're supportive of us because we're on the doorstep. But on a national level, there's no party that supports or, or, or doesn't support us, if that makes sense. So where do you um, where do you see Amen Services going in the next year or two? Well, I hope we're still here and, and, and fighting. That's the main thing. But um, what I'm hoping um, is that we have an outreach service. Um, now it op- operates one day a week in Dublin, so at least it accommodates people who can't get to here to Navan to the office in Navan. But what I'm hoping is that we can expand that um, and get an outreach service. Uh, even if it's once a month for starters, in different parts of the country. Um, Because we have a court of company or somebody who who goes with men to apply for stuff in court and be with them on the day of court and that. So I'm hoping that we can set up him um, to do a few more clinics. Maybe not nationwide because we wouldn't have the resources, but even in other counties that are um, surrounding us, we say, for people that can't get here. So that's that's my hope for the moment. The, the the thing you said is that at the national level, uh, the uh, <laughs> you sit there by yourself uh, on on the men's issues. You, you are the whole table. But one of the things I know you mm-hmm. mentioned to me in our interview earlier in the week is that it, to some extent, though, other agencies that work with the domestic violence issue are now forced to work with you. Are they men services? No, no, no. They're not. Oh. Um, no, they, they don't. In, in in some in some instances they are in terms of we do sit at a table for certain things together, but um, nobody's forced to work with us. If that makes sense, you know, um, we there's there's a few meetings that I participate in on forums and so on where there will be members from um, the women's groups at it, but um, they're all they're always normally they're fine with me. But then again, that's an individual person as opposed to a, a whole organisation. I see, but in none of the local agencies or others that you work with, they, they, you're just sort of a pariah. They're not interested in talking to you at all, except maybe a few people on an individual level within mm. the system are willing to work with you. Is that the long and short exactly. of it? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Well, it's upsetting to hear, but it's also uh, it's nothing we haven't heard before. Um, not being dismissive, but we see the same thing in, in parts of the United States. We see it in Australia. Believe it or not, Australia seems to be more advanced than anybody on that, but they're still chronically fighting with the feminist lobbies to get any sort of traction for attention to male victims. And it would seem to me the great tragedy of all of this is that if we stop treating it as a gendered issue at all, we could help. We could not just help more men, we could help more women and children, couldn't we? Yes, indeed. Mm-hmm. Um, well, um, let's see, I believe, oh, oh, isn't there something coming down from, uh, Brussels now on, on the domestic violence issue, um, uh, about where they're talking about, uh, expanding, uh, uh programs for so-called violence against women, and they're mm-hmm. even changing the language now, so that they're not even saying women and children anymore. They're saying women, women and, and girls. girls isn't it? Yeah, I saw that. Women and girls. Um, yeah. I think you mentioned that to me too, Aaron. Um, I, it's it's a subtle but uh, rather startling shift. I mean, there's oh, something no, it was always disturbing. there. It was it was very much there. With it's the UN actually mm. it's coming I, well, down. Well, from, it's already oh, coming down from the UN. Yeah, and I, that's I, always I mean, al- been. It's always been a little disturbing to me that we say the phrase women and children as if they're, they go together, as if they're the mm-hmm. same thing even, which is rather infantilizing of women, if nothing else. But the fact that they're shifting the language to women and girls, so boys, even little boys, are now being elided out of this whole thing? Well, th- th- we've had this discussion. Boko Haram, right, in Nigeria. Michelle uh, Obama today... Mm-hmm as holding these huge meetings about the what had happened to these girls. And there is no mention at all of the boys that were slaughtered and the many set alight all the way through the press stories. And I've been so upset by this. There's, it's all about girls. And it's almost as though, as far as the Obama administration is concerned, men and boys don't matter. Mm. No, yeah, there's, uh, in case anybody didn't catch that, there's these st- horrible stories about a terrorist group that's been kidnapping girls and, and harassing girls in Nigeria. Nigeria. And the, the president and the first lady of the United States have talked about it, and it's all over the news. And if you dig through the news story, you'll find these same groups. They'll go into a school or whatever. They'll kidnap the girls, but they'll kill all the boys. Yeah. And yet... You usually have to dig three or four paragraphs into the story at least to see that being mentioned at all. These are boys sometimes being set on fire and burnt to death, um, uh, or, or you know, if they're lucky, they just get caught escaping and get their cuts, their throats cut, and just die quickly that way. Sometimes they're just set on fire or otherwise tortured. And all we're talking about is the girls. Has mm-hmm. this sort of inhumanity to the male half of the human species just getting? Worse or what? I don't... I, I, I think that side of it is getting worse. I'm astounded that Michelle Obama can actually, in a sense, support this terrible separatist attitudes towards other children, boys, getting killed. I, uh, I saw that you wrote a sharp note to The Guardian about it. I wonder if I they did. ever got back to you. No, I didn't expect them to. They don't ever get back to me. <laughs> I'm laughing because there's nothing else to do but laugh, I guess, except, except continue what we're doing to try to raise yeah. awareness mm-hmm. of the fact that there is a problem here, and it's growing, not shrinking, in a lot of ways. Yeah, um, I, I know here in the the United States, I know one of the uh, uh, people are afraid to criticize feminism, but I'm sorry, you know, feminist de- feminist defense of our Violence Against Women Act, they'll often. Uh, defend it and say, well, it's called the Violence Against Women Act, but if you read it, most of the language is gender neutral. Well, Neve, weren't you saying that there's something very similar there in Ireland, that, mm. that much of the legislation yeah. is written well, the that way? But... Perfect. <laughs> the legislation's yeah. perfect. It's all gender neutral. It's lovely. If it was implemented like that, it would be even oh. better. So it's, the legislation is written gender neutral, but the mm. way it's enforced yeah. and the way the funding flows is absolutely not, mm. is what you'd say. Yeah, no, no, no. The legislation is all gender neutral. The policy, we have a national strategy on domestic violence. It's um, On the face of it, it's, um, it's gender neutral. When you dig into it, it's not, because a lot of the, the strategies and the national goals, and, and don't get me wrong, it's a fabulous document, but um, 
the, the goals and the, and the levels, the different levels of goals for the strategy for the last four years, and um, a lot of them are only relevant to, to the women to the women because we don't have those resources to even be part of that discussion. But in theory, it's a lovely document. <laughs> Well, um, one of the people I was hoping I was going to call in today but did not was Men Human Rights Ireland, which is a new group that started up to talk about these things. Uh, perhaps I'll put them in touch with you. I know that the men's movement is beginning to grow in Ireland, and I think it's desperately needed to um, bring attention to this Dean, sort of thing. is that Joe Gormley? Mm. John Gormley, yes, it yeah, is. He actually yeah. left a message for me to ring him on Friday, but I didn't get a chance to ring him. He's on my Facebook. He tells terrible jokes, but they're good fun. <laughs> No, I mean, he's a good guy. <laughs> he he's is a good, good guy. guy. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, uh, but in any case, uh, we, we're getting sort of near the end of the show here, so um, I want to make sure we've gotten to everything we wanted to talk about. In general, um, it's it's good to know that there is at least one resource that gives a damn about uh, boys and men in Ireland and is actually out there doing something. Oh, it looks like we have a caller on the line. Um, can we uh, bring that caller on the line, James? Uh, yes, we can. We're going to go ahead and bring Iron John on the air here in just a moment. Hello, John. Are you there? Yes, I am. Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. What, what was your question? Oh, well, you, you beat me to it, Dean. I was going to ask the caller from Ireland... Um, I'm, I'm afraid I can't pronounce her name yet. I've never seen it before. <laughs> Neve. <laughs> and I don't... Oh, Neve. Okay. Did I get that right? That's right, yes. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, I'm terrible with names, um, so you'll have to forgive me if I if I stumble over it a few times. Um, I was going to ask what Dean just talked about, and that was the the two new groups in Ireland. I noticed that there are two of them. And I was wondering, um, do you have any plans to work with them? Have you met them? And most importantly, can you can you please explain why there's two and not one? I haven't been able to figure that out yet. I haven't. I said I only had um, I had a phone message from the um, the new human rights men. But I'm not sure exactly what they're called the other day. But I didn't get a chance to contact them yet. So I'll be talking to them this week coming, hopefully. I must say, well, I, don't, I didn't even know there was a second one. Oh. What are they called? Uh, I no, cannot. Yeah, I there is a second group. There is not. There is not. I will give you the short answer, and there's really oh. no reason to go into a whole lot of detail about it. There were two different men's rights organizations that started off uh, in, I think they're in Dublin both, but um, there were some problems, and one of them has gone away. And now there's just the one, and it's Men's Human Rights Ireland, and uh, John Gormley's the one in charge of it, and uh, I do know that they'll probably want to get a hold of Amen Services. I know for yeah. a fact that they do, because they're, they're, be they're doing some good stuff there to raise awareness, and domestic violence is one of the issues they feel very passionate about. It's not the only issue they care about, but it's certainly one of the biggest ones, because it matters a great deal. So... Um, there is that. So, um, is there anything else either of you ladies would like to talk about before we wrap up the show? No, but I'm really, really glad to have talked to you, Neve. And I'm, if any time you need anything that I can do or help you, just please get in contact with me, okay? Well, I'm really honoured to talk to you because I've heard your name floating around since the first day I started here. <laughs> Probably my capacity well. to drink Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> I will make sure that the two of you actually exchange phone numbers after this call. How about okay. that? That can't be too tough. All right. So <laughs> to remind everybody, again, our guest today has been Neve uh, Farrell from Amen, Ire Amen Services in Ireland. You can find their web page at amen, A-M-E-N, dot I-E, in Ireland. Their helpline for men who are in trouble is 046-902-3718. You can find them on Twitter. Uh, you can find them on Facebook as Amen Support Services. Uh, they do receive a very small amount of government funding, which helps them a little bit, but they're a charitable organization. So if you are looking for to do some charitable donating uh, for people in Ireland, that would be splendid. 
Uh, do you have any final thoughts for the audience, Neve? Um, no, I'm just um, the, the, the Facebook, Twitter. We're all we're very new to this, um, and it's actually working really well for us. And um, we've got we've got a lot of referrals now through it, and it's it's very new to us. So we're delighted with that. Well, Holy. excellent. And we're actually we're, we're engaging at the moment now. This um, next month, we're going to have our awareness campaign. Um, for two weeks and we're looking at a rebranding project um, to change the images and so on of Amen. So there's a lot of work going on at the moment. Well, excellent. I'm really so glad that you're there and while there's negative developments coming down the road, there's positive ones too. Um, uh, so uh, keep in touch, Neve, and uh, we'll keep uh, people apprised of what's going on in Ireland Uh on future episodes of the show. Erin, do you have any closing thoughts for the week? No, not really. I just have a closing thought that people will be coming in all over the world to the conferences, one in Toronto and one with you, Dean, in uh, Detroit. And uh, that is really, I think, a big turning point in the whole of the movement. Uh, I think you're going to have to get some funding somewhere to come. <laughs> oh, I wish I'd love to see well. you there, love. <laughs> The big conference on domestic violence in particular is TorontoDV.com. Uh, That's TorontoDV.com. That's going to be June 6th and 7th at the Toronto Convention Center. And then a uh, couple of weeks later in June, about three weeks later exactly, in Detroit, the uh, first international conference on men's issues, first time in history, it's going to be held in Detroit, Michigan, in the United States. Uh, that's going to be June 26th through 28th. Uh, Aaron and I will be at both of those events, so uh, we hope to see people come out for that. The Detroit, uh, the Detroit conference will be about far more than domestic violence, although that will be part of the agenda. We'll be talking about poison ed education. We'll be talking about the court system, the criminal justice system, and many more things than that. Uh, but in any case, and then you'll find it be details about that on the front page of A Voice for Men. And otherwise, I'll remind everybody to check out Amen Support Services. That's at Amen Ireland uh, on Twitter and Amen.ie on the web and Amen Support Services on Facebook. In two weeks, we will be here with Senator Ann Cools, so I hope you will all tune in. I guess, James, go ahead and take us home. You have been listening to Domestic Violence Revelations with Erin Pitsey and me, her co-host, Dean Esme. Our show's opening music and closing music is known as Sunshine and Eternal Hope, respectively, and is by Kevin McLeod and used under Creative Commons Attribution License, with a link in the show notes. We also want to thank James Huff and Paul Elam and all of those who are part of the A Voice for Men community for their support for this show. Remember, if you're a victim of domestic violence, no matter if you're a man or a woman, gay or straight, adult or child, no matter what your race, your ethnicity, your religious views, your sexual orientation, or anything else, what you went through or are going through now is not okay. You should not be afraid to talk about it with people who understand and care. Just remember to talk to people who do understand and not to ideologues who fear the truth or will marginalize you and your experiences. Remember, the truth about domestic abuse is often painful to hear, especially to ideologues and especially to those who've been through it and been marginalized and ignored. But remember, in truth, there is hope and healing. And we hope you'll be a part of helping to spread the truth and the healing. Please join us next time on Domestic Violence Revelations with Aaron Pitsy and yours truly, Dean Esme. God bless you.